So with that, I'm going to start the program and pass it over to our moderator. She said I could shorten her bio, but I think I'm going to read most of it because she has quite an exciting bio. Um, so we have Brittany Ishibashi here today. Um, Brittany can be seen most recently as the villainous Tina Minoru in Marvel's hit show Runaways on Hulu, Claire Comier in the CW's Tom Swift, and as Tamiko Masuda on CBS's Hawaii Five-0. She paid an, played another iconic villain, Karai, in Paramount's blockbuster hit Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. So she was born and raised in Orange County, California, and Brittany was raised in a home filled with the arts. Um, she had a literal front row and sometimes backstage seat to shows that her parents performed in and promoted. Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, Motown Legends, and of course, Sansei Rockers, all inspired a desire to perform from a very young age. Her family encouraged her to try her hand in many facets of the entertainment world, and she often got on stage with them to sing along. Discovering her passion for performance at a young age Brittany went on to be a triple threat, excelling in dance, music, and acting, and she continued her formal education at UCLA's prestigious School of Theater, Film, and Television while building her acting resume outside of class. Brittany has gone on to work consistently over the years on numerous television series, including This Is Us, Major Crimes, The Office, Grey's Anatomy, Grace and Frankie, and the Golden Globe and Emmy-nominated series Political Animals. She also voices some loved animated characters on popular Netflix cartoons and has worked on films alongside Robert, directors Robert Redford, Danny DeVito, and Denzel Washington. And she lives in the LA area with her husband Jeff and their three children, Kai, Lilia, and Ma McKenna. So with that, I'm going to introduce Ring Brittany on stage. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. You know, I was waiting off stage and I could feel the excitement in this room. And I was born out of this dance party era. I, I grew up, you know, literally backstage and had, had that literal front row seat to all these shows. And it just brought back so many memories of, you know, walking through a hotel kitchen, you know, to go uh, see my parents perform in a ballroom or sitting at the Kona Hawaii and around this incredibly colorful cast of characters with this incredible music and eating my version of sushi at the time, which was a Cheerio with a little Ikura egg on top. Um, and it, it's, it just brought back so many memories. And I'm so excited to be here when Uncle Harry called and asked if I would be here to moderate. I jumped at the chance. I have so many incredible memories growing up uh, with these guys. Um, this auditorium, all the tickets were gone in less than 48 hours. Shortly after, we had a wait list that could fill another auditorium. And everyone, I believe, is here joining us on Zoom. Um, and it just got me thinking, we're all so hungry and excited to relive these memories. So without further ado, I hope you would join me in welcoming to the stage Tina Fujino, Harry Manaka, David Honjo, and Gerald Ishibashi, the Sansa Rockers. I have uh, double mics here, but I'll just Whoa. put this one here. I'm gonna slide this one off stage real quick. Do, do, do. Hey, David Honjo you needs your microphone. <laughs> There's this, oh, oh, that, I took your microphone. Ha <laughs> 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 Check, check. There you go. All right, well, hello everyone. Before we start, I wanted to do a quick little, uh, quick little rundown of the tremendous bios of this uh, group that we have up here. Also, I hope you don't mind, but I have my um, little timer and my clock up here, because we did a little pre-panel um, with these guys, and they can talk story. So I'm gonna kind of <laughs> keep us on track here. All right, I'm gonna start with this gentleman to my left. Harry Manaka, who I affectionately call <laughs> Uncle Harry. <laughs> Harry joined the Something Else Band in 1967 after hanging around Parkview Women's Club and Roger Young Auditorium. As a spectator, show of hands, who would spend their weekends dancing at a Roger Young Auditorium? Okay. okay. All right, all right. As the keyboardist for the group, he initially played the Farfisa Combo Compact Organ, later switching to the iconic Hammond B3. That's a beast, what is it, like 400 pounds? That's it. 450 pounds. Oh my goodness. 
Uh, the instrument, that was the instrument he became known for on the Sansei dance party circuit. In January 1968, something else became the house band at Itchy Foot Mos, a club located behind Cal State LA in El Serrano. Harry later played keyboards with Longtime Cummin in 1971, joining his longtime friend and UCLA schoolmate. <laughs> How are you, Yoshida? Hi. <laughs> Tina Fujino also became a member of the group at the same time. Long Time Coming became the first all Sansei band to play in Japan on an extended engagement in 1972. In early 73, Harry and guitarist David Jingu reformulated the Something Else band and started playing at the Baby Lion Supper Club as the house band. Yeah, some memories of Baby Lion. <laughs> Harry and David later purchased the Baby Lion and became business partners as well as bandmates. In early 81, Harry and Gerald Ishibashi, this gentleman to my right, teamed to form the Sansei All-Stars as part of Gerald's vision to recreate the good old days for the Sansei population. In 2020, of course, you all know, Harry wrote and self-published his book, Chronicles of a Sansei Rocker. Hopefully we'll get some behind the scenes looks, uh, stories, and some special uh, insight and tidbits today. I'd like to move on to David Honjo over here to my right. David began playing music with his older brother, cousin, and friends at age 11 in a group called The Essence. The group performed at Pancake Breakfasts, Community Center Dances, Nisei Week Talent Shows, School Dances, Battle of the Bands. David joined the Prophets Band at 15 and played the trumpet and flugelhorn, as well as singing lead and background vocals, playing the congas and other percussion instruments. Later, David became the founding member of the Carry On Band in 1971. Woo! I heard a woo up there. <laughs> David also played trumpet on several albums and CDs with the fusion jazz group you might know called Hiroshima. The Carry On Band also headlined at Japanese Village in Deer Park for several years and also performed on the Tomorrowland Terrace at Disneyland. In 1981, David became part of the first Sansei All-Stars band, joining Gerald Ishibashi and Harry Manaka. <laughs> Got three of them here. Tina Fujino. In 1967, at the age of 17, Tina became one of the first female Asian-American vocalists on the Sansei dance party circuit when she became a member of The Chosen Few. <laughs> yes. Tina enjoyed the wide variety of music played, the close family unit that was formed, and working with wonderful musicians such as male vocalists Rick Macabeo and Royce Jones. Ah! In 1971, Tina joined Harry Manaka in Long Time Coming. She particularly enjoyed working on vocal harmonies with Howie, Hiyoshida, and Randy Yoshimoto. And in 1972, Long Time Coming became the first all Sansei group to play the extended engagement in Japan. Tina also worked as a female vocalist for several other Sansei dance party circuit groups, including Free Flight, Something Else, and Hiroshima. <laughs> Gerald Ishibashi. Since his first professional performance as frontman and band leader at 13 years old, <laughs> the name Gerald Ishibashi has been synonymous with entertainment. Over the years, Gerald has led a colorful, definitely colorful, and varied career as a musician, entertainer, music store owner, concert promoter, MC, motivational speaker, and producer, and great father. <laughs> mic drop, literal mic drop. Gerald formed, Gerald formed his eponymous Ishibashi, Stonebridge Productions, in 1980, and built it into one of the leading live entertainment production entities in the events industry. As a musician producer, he has performed and worked with a number of the music industry's biggest names, such as Three Dog Night, Blondie, Jackson Brown, Michael McDonald, Pat Benatar, Cool and the Gang, The Beach Boys, and The Righteous Brothers. In 1981, Gerald connected with Harry Manaka and with his help created the Sansei All-Stars. In 2010, Gerald was recruited to perform with longtime friends Society of Seven. 
And he was also the co-leader of a popular LA-based 11-piece rock band and the creator of the Island Crooners, whose concert film is in development for public television. Now, we're gonna jump right into this panel discussion. Um, I know they have a lot of stories they wanna share, so I wanna pose this first question to everyone, because I'm sure everyone's interested. I'm curious to know how you all first got your start on the dance party circuit, and if you have any special uh, recollections of what it was to first, what it was like to first join the group. And the crowd roared. And the crowd roared. <laughs> Let's start with Tina. You know, I started uh, <coughs> with the chosen few and had never been to any of the dances before, and I just kind of gotten as I Lorraine remembers, because she knows my friend Akimi Fujikawa, who is a stellar dancer, but really never sang. And she happened to be the person they wanted to recruit to be their singer. And she kept telling them she couldn't sing, but nobody wanted to listen to her tell them that she, she couldn't sing. So she begged me to come with her, and a bunch of ladies and I went to the audition, and. They asked her if she would sing, and she said, no, but my friend can sing, and she dragged me to the front. I, their PA was out, so I sang a cappella, um, and they asked me to join the band. Yes. All right. As, as probably the first, right, or one of, one of the only female that singers in that, of, in, yeah. Yeah, in, in, in that scene at the time. We'll get into that so. a little bit later. Yeah, <laughs> um, Uncle Harry. Okay, much like all of you, you know, I used to hang around at Parkview and Roger Young, and you know, I'd go to watch the bands, and one in particular, a band called the Emeralds, and I believe a couple of the Emeralds are here today, um, Mark Guerrero and Anthony Bure. <laughs> yeah. I used to, as I said, hang out, and their manager was a guy by, by the name of Ray Ballesteros, and that was Aaron Ballesteros' father. And uh, I used to always, you know, admire how well they played. And another up-and-coming band at the time was a group called Something Else, and I used to admire that band, too. And um, one of the players within Something Else, um, Dennis Matsura, the late Dennis Matsura Royce, I don't know whether he, you, know, you knew that he passed away uh, recently, yeah. But uh, Denny Matsura got drafted. And uh, Barry Tambara, who I know some of you know, <clears throat> uh, who went to Roosevelt High School, um, he was starting to concentrate on his teaching career. He had graduated from Cal State LA and he was going to start his teaching career. So it appeared that the band was going to break up. And, uh, you know, I, they had decided to break up, and I was there at Parkview the night that they made that decision. I said, wait a minute, I play keyboards. <laughs> so, and it's like, of course, I didn't have any keyboards to play, but, you know, I figured I had taken piano lessons so I could play keyboards. And, uh, you know, long story longer, uh, I went, I purchased a uh, Farfisa, Farfisa Combo Compact which was pretty cool at that time. And uh, went to audition, they took me, and uh, kind of the rest is history. You know, we started playing uh, probably the next week or a couple weeks after that. Quick. <laughs> Quick question before, before we move on. Was, was, you said that you were training like classically with piano. Was it always kind of like a battle to, to play the kind of music that was in your heart and your soul to play? To let that out. Is uh, Lisa Joe in the house here today? <laughs> hey, Lisa. Okay. I, I took lessons from Lisa's mom. And uh, she and I would just battle. I mean, we, we would have some battle royales. I, Lisa, I hope I, I didn't traumatize you when you were a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it was, she wanted me to play classical, and she said, you know, I had uh, the skills to become a, a, a classical pianist, and uh, 
I just really love the rock and roll. You know, I, I, I spent every dime that I had going down to the uh, liquor store and, you know, getting those old 45s out of the, uh, the record bin. So uh, she and I battled, and uh, bless her heart, you know, she did teach me a lot of the fundamentals that came in handy later on when I did uh, actually learn to play. So uh, I'm, I'm thankful for those lessons. David, do you want to jump in? How you got your start? Oh, okay. Uh, first, let me just say how honored I am uh, to be here. This is a uh, this is a great uh, great thing. We were all talking in the back how lucky we are to be here. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, I started really young, so when I was 14 years old, I used to go to Roger Young or to Parkview to watch the bands play. And I remember very clearly seeing something else in Royce Jones right here in his white suit uh, singing. And I was so impressed. I thought, that's what I want to do. And I remember I told Tina also that I went to see Chosen Few, and I had the same idea. I said, look at this young Asian girl can really sing rock and roll, and how unusual that was, because I had never seen that. So anyway, what happened was uh, I had a friend, and we, uh, <clears throat> he asked me one day, he says, you have a band, right? He says, my dad has an arthritis telethon on Channel 5, and uh, would your band be interested in playing? And, and I thought, gee, yeah, okay. So what happened was we were going to go on it, but everybody in my band said, well, we don't have a singer. We need a singer. So uh, my cousin happened to know uh, John Hubbard, who was the leader of the Prophets. So he graciously came down and, and sang with us. And after that, he asked me if I would join the Prophets. And I thought, did you just ask me to join Chicago? I, mean, I was like, I thought, oh my God, I can't believe you're. A so I said, sure, I would love to. And I remember the first night I played, and two of the guys that are here tonight, David Akiyama and, and uh, Gary Morgucci, were some of the original members in the Prophets. And I can remember that like it was yesterday. And I remember one of the things I remember was at the end of the night, we played the dance. And Gary came over to me and said, OK, I'm going to pay you. And I said, well, I get paid to do this? <laughs> and I think it was like $30, $35, but I thought it was $150. I mean, it was. Wow. And I thought, oh, this is it. I, I made it. I'm, 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 this is the big time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's how I got started. And, and then ever since uh, that first night playing with uh, the Prophets, um, when the Prophets broke up, uh, we formed the Carry On Band and uh, have been playing actually ever since then. So that's, nice. that's my story. Now, is it true, because you were so young when you got your start, that your mom would drive you yes, to that's gigs? A, that's a very embarrassing story. <laughs> yeah. the, the guys in the band were all from L.A., and I was from San Fernando Valley, so I was kind of thought of as a hick. So I would come down to like a little bumpkin. And so the guys would say, your mom's going to drop you off at the Holiday Inn? And so she would drop me off in the station wagon. And then at the end of the night, they would come and pick me up So because uh, I couldn't drive. But uh, yeah, that's a true story. And, and thanks for bringing that up. But, uh, and then uh, Gerald slash dad. Uh, you thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> Again, we're so so grateful to see all you folks showing up here today on a Saturday afternoon. But uh, speaking of Hicks, oh. I grew up in the Imperial Valley, and my dad had a trucking company. One summer, I worked for him. And instead of paying me, he said, you can have an electric guitar and an amp or a Honda motorcycle. Tough decision. I still have that guitar and amp today. And it started me playing rock and roll music. We, had, we played down there. We didn't have very few sansays. I don't know if there's any here from Imperial Valley. But uh, we uh, played gigs all through, uh, actually, I was in eighth grade when I got in, uh, put in a group called Little Paul and the Starlighters and played ever since. Moved up here to go to uh, business college, and my uncle was in the J.A. Optimist, and he said, you should put a band together and play for these society functions. And uh, to backtrack just a little bit, I remember my cousins, uh, Jennifer and Miles Ueda, took me to a Roger Young dance. And I didn't put it together until we were backstage today that I saw a band that was called The Chosen Few, and Tina was singing in it. And it was the first opportunity to walk into a Sansei function. Mind you, I grew up with a bunch of good old boys from the South. 
And walking into a Sansi dance back then was like walking into the Star Wars bar scene. <laughs> you know, they had fronts in a hay, rock one netted out. Different cars, we had Ford and Chevrolet pickups where I came from. And I'm looking at this different music and Tina's wearing uh, a way on stage, David Jingle. And I remember this uh, Husky conga player, Sansi player. And I said, my gosh, the entire band's Japanese American. <laughs> And I looked around, the entire audience, and they dressed different than we did, they danced different than we did, and I said, this is fantastic, what a scene. So getting back to moving up here to college, my uncle, Kimi Takata, said, you should have your band, which became Stonebridge, and play some of the functions, the society functions and whatnot. So we, I started looking at these bands, Winfield Summit, uh, something else. Um, what was the name of your band again? <laughs> Andy anyway, carry on. But they were great bands, Free Flight, uh, some phenomenal, phenomenally talented individuals. And I said, you know, that's, that's a pretty crowded field. So we chose to take our business into more of a society directions and, uh, because that crowd was really competitive. And from there, we started the Stonebridge Band. And I don't know, probably some people in here, we've probably paid some of your weddings. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one person. We don't want to talk about it anymore because most of them are on their second or third wedding. So, uh, but it, it, it was a great experience. And from there, we started to get this following. And I'm really indebted to the Sanse community because when we started promoting concerts, the Sanse community rallied and supported us. And I remember playing at the Biltmore Hotel. You remember, Bryce. We had Mary Wells, Bretton Wood, the Association, Midnighters, Little Willie G. And we had the Sanse groups. And the Sanse community is what got us our toehold in that market. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Now, like you mentioned, I mean, there were so many incredible bands that were, that were filling that dance party scene at that time. So I'm curious if there was any sort of healthy competition or any sort of rivalry or anything, any jealousy, like how that all worked, how, how with, with all the different <laughs> bands that were going on, how you all fought to be on a ticket, or, or you know, how that all worked. You know, I always, I always thought that uh, the bands got along pretty well. And, uh, you know, we all rooted for each other, and I always felt that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So, you know, what made one of us, one of the groups better, kind of raised the standard for all of us, and we all aspired to be as good as, you know, the next band. So I thought that healthy competition actually helped us all just in terms of raising the bar in terms of professionality and all that. So uh, I think all the bands, as far as I remember, got along pretty well. You know, we were pretty friendly with each other. Oh, I have to say, that's true, but behind the scenes, we wanted to beat you guys. <laughs> We, you know, in those days... Now it comes out. In, yeah, in, the, in those, honestly, in those days, <coughs> all the bands wanted to be the, the, the last band to play because that meant you were the, the you know, yeah. everybody would stay the headliner. You would be the headliner, that right? Yeah. So there was a competition, and it made us really practice hard because we wanted to be chosen few. We wanted to be as good as something else. I don't know if we ever reached that, but we always tried. And I think that we worked really, really hard to, to try to be as good as we could so that we could be the... The, the band that was playing last in the in the evening, Ken, is that right? Right, Ken. Right. That's Kenito right there. He's a Carry On member originally. Yeah. So yeah, he remembers that. Anyway. And I, I did have a question, kind of tied to that. You had told me an interesting story before. I was hoping you could share it with with how Carry On got its name. Yeah, a lot of people ask me how to carry on because it's an unusual name. Mm -hmm. So the way we did it was we were sitting around after we had broken up from the Prophets and we were trying to figure out well, what's a good name. And Dennis Hoda, our bass player, said, well, you know, uh, we're kind of carrying on from the Prophets, so why don't we call ourselves Carry On? And we thought about it with the that sounds like a really good idea. So the very first time we were going to play, and we were all excited because they put it in the Rafa Shimpo, and they would put your name in there. So we told them the name of the band. And when we went to go get the paper and we looked at it, they listed us as the carryovers. <laughs> and we thought, man, I, you know, which is kind of true also, right? right? But but not quite as good, not quite as good as carry on. So. Um, 
And then later on, some people mistook our name to mean Carrion, which is like dead oh. meat. So they would say, why did you call your band Carrion? You know? And I said, no, 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 it's Carry On, not, not Carrion. So that's how we got our name. It's a carry On from the Prophets. Carry On from the Prophets. I'm also curious with just given the political and cultural climate of the time, if there was any sort of uh, racial or ethnic tension, given that most of the groups were mixed race, right, within in that in that era. There's I don't really remember anything mm-hmm. like that at all. I think we all got along really well. And we also I think <laughs> I think we also really enjoyed each other's food. That's the one thing I remember. Uh, yeah. Is sharing food, you know, that would... Yeah. You know, if there was anything good that came out of the bands and the mixed, mixed you know, uh, composition of the bands, it was that our families got exposure to black kids, Hispanic kids, you know, white kids, where, whereas, you know, in the old Nisei culture, you know, they were, it was very sequestered and, and very kind of uh, hanging around with those of your own race. But, you know, I think once I started bringing black guys and Hispanic guys and white guys, you know, over to the house, you know, my family realized, you know, oh, by the way, my mom is watching from uh, Squim, Washington. <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> you know, they learned to uh, realize that you know, we're all humans, we're all just humans. And, you know, they, they came to uh, actually like these guys that would hang out at, our, at my house. So, uh, you know, I, I thought that was a beneficial thing and kind of not only, uh, not only were we integrated groups, but I think it helped to help our families to realize that, hey, you know, the other races that are out there are, are, are human, just like us, you know? I think, uh, yeah. When I grew up, we had very few Sansi, so uh, my brother and I, Grant, were the only Sansi musicians, probably in the Imperial Valley. So we had a, a lot of um, Hakujin, Holly players, as well as uh, Mexican-American players. And so we ended up playing diverse groups from the get-go, uh, like quinceañeras. We played dances at the uh, halls. And so we always were exposed to integrating the group uh, because there was only two Japanese musicians <laughs> <laughs> and the door probably wouldn't have gotten far. And you also, I, I've got to mention, you know, growing up you always told us that music is a universal language mm-hmm. and you can, you know, if you play a melody or a certain tune or there's an instrument, it strikes a chord and it can resonate with someone no matter where you're from, what your current situation is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, Tina, I know that you also, kind of a segue from that, when you were playing in Japan, mm-hmm. what was that like playing for a primarily just Japanese-speaking audience and performing, performing there? You know, it was the very first time that I was able to go to Japan, and it was totally, totally mind-boggling for me because you get off the plane and everybody looks like your relatives, <laughs> which is really unusual, you know, for those of you who've never been in that situation. So I really, and then I had kind of an interesting thing happen to me in the restaurant that we were playing at. We played at the top and there was, there was an Italian uh, cafe on the bottom, there was an international cuisine in the middle, and then on the top was where we played, right? And I remember being in the elevator and with a, I walked into the elevator. There was a strange man in there, a Japanese, a man from Japan, and he says to me in Japanese, oh, are you Japanese? And in English, I answered him, yes. And then he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, no, you're not. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm not. And then so we tried to get into this conversation about why was I, looked, why did I look just like everybody in Japan when I was from America? You know, what, why was I, it, we, we went as far as we could in the conversation, but it was pretty involved. Okay, so your parents, are they Japanese? You know, uh, both of your parents? Were they, oh no, they were born in, yeah, but they were born in the United States, you know. Oh, it was, it was a really funny concept mm-hmm. for him. Yeah. And then as I was talking to him, I realized it was a very 
funny concept for me, too, <laughs> to explain to him why I look just like everybody else in Japan, and my mother and father happened to marry each other, and they both appeared, their parents were from, from Japan, and really I wasn't Japanese, which was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I am Japanese. Yes. No, you're not. You know, it's funny, but uh, over there they use the word, they, they say gaijin, and they, re they referred to us, you know, us Japanese guys as gaijin. And it was the strangest thing. You know, we, we would get on public transportation, and I'd try to use my limited Japanese. I, I, I'd say, sumimasen, nihongo hanashimasen. And they would look at me like I was crazy, you know, from another planet or something. But taking it full circle, uh, Royce and I uh, continued on with the Stonebridge Band, and we tour and play casinos, and we were at the, I think it was in Yakima. And uh, where there were some of the temptations, and we had a great event. And afterwards, the tribal elders of the tribe wanted to meet us and give us gifts. And I remember Roy saying, they look like your uncles. <laughs> <laughs> so we walked out of the dressing room, and they're standing in a circle, and they're giving us blankets and jackets. And I said, man, you guys look like my uncles. And they just laugh. But they truly, uh, these Native Americans, look like our Nisei relatives. And it came full circle, and Royce and I sat back there and like, we just shook our heads. It's just such a commonality. Uh, and as well as probably the struggles that they endured overlap some of what our families did, but uh, I thought that was a nice moment. I'm also curious with, um, I mean, I know you, you all gather so much inspiration um, and healthy competition from, you know, from the fellow bands that were performing. But I'm curious what other, where else you found your inspiration or your musical or artistic voice to perform? And, and, and if what, what gave you that special, like if it was something that was in you that, that was like a passion or something that was just fun or something you felt like you had to do, um, and if it was supported by your parents and your family, or if they thought it was something that was like a silly hobby, or if it was something that they encouraged you to pursue. You know, I mentioned that I had that uh, <laughs> Farfisa Combo Compact. You know, it, uh, I mean, for its time, it, uh, it was a pretty cool instrument, uh, Dave Akiyama. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I started hanging, hanging out, or I started watching a group called the Young Rascals, you know, with Felix Cavalier at the uh, B3. And I went to a place called the Carousel, I don't know whether any of you remember the carousel. It was like a circular, you know, the stage would rotate so that, you know, in any seat that you were in, you had a chance to see the entire band. And I sat through two shows. I was just fascinated by uh, Felix Cavalier playing the B3. And I said, man, I got to have one of those. Yeah. So I started scouring the uh, classified ads and, uh, Finally found one for sale. I think it was like three thousand bucks, you know, which was a lot of money back in the day. And uh, then the problem after I bought it, I didn't know how to haul it around or or do anything. How so, did you haul it around? Eddie Portugal, up there. Um, his father had a uh, was it a pickup truck? Ed? Yeah. So Ed Portugal, our drummer at the time, his father helped me get the truck, or get the uh, B3 from where I purchased it over to Itchy Foot Mose, where we had been playing at. And uh, Ed tells me the story that his father uh, kind of remembers that day uh, sitting uh, inside Itch Itchy Foot Mose, and there was this dead rat on the floor kind of in its last throws. <laughs> and uh, Ed, that's, that's all that Ed's father remembered about that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had to have the B3 and I had to have uh, what's called the Leslie 122. You know, you keyboard aficionados know what I'm talking about. You know, without the, without the Leslie, you know, the, the B3 really doesn't sound right or the way it should. So uh, I had to have it and I evolved from that Farfisa into the B3 and uh, boy, you know, <laughs> That was a backbreaker to move that thing around, though, I'll tell you. 
Um, well, we're going to start going into a Q&A pretty soon, but I also kind of want to touch on something I'm, I'm curious Post dance party era, like as you transitioned out of the dance party era, where life took you? Like, did you continue to perform? Do you continue to perform? Um, family, kids, grandkids, or do they all have a performing bug? I know your answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, before we go into a Q&A from the audience and from everyone who's watching on Zoom, I was just curious if you wanted to share any of what you kind of were up to recently. Well, since you threw it in my lap. Uh, I've always believed that we all come here with a vision implanted in our hearts, and it's up to us to uncover it. So I always um, uh, told my daughter, Sue, I'm here to help you uncover your vision and to do everything in your power to manifest it sooner the better and I was talking to myself. So after that dancing, I realized that since we did so many Sansei weddings, I, said, I realized we're gonna run out of customers. Because I don't think they're gonna hire, like I said, they're gonna hire us for the second and third wedding. So we, we decided to focus on uh, the Newport Beach area and started to uh, produce concerts and we kept the band going. And Harry played with us until he had to move. Royce Jones played with us always and uh, so we just kept it going because that was our passion and I had a music store before that but uh, I wasn't destined to be a music store owner thanks to a, a recession but uh, we kept we kept it going and we still do uh, because that's what we feel we we're put here for so uh, oh and I pass it on to Brittany and her sisters they're all performers and uh, her niece just did her first acting job on Netflix as a cartoon character, six years old. So we're oh. continuing. Tina? Uh, let's see. I'm the one who probably hasn't been around for a long, long, long time. So I stopped singing uh, in 1977 and moved to Wisconsin where I practiced what I was going to school for, which was to be a social worker. I worked with teens for a long time. Uh, I worked for about five years with teen boys, delinquent teen boys, and uh, Willie Miyazaki, Dr. Miyazaki now, who, who played in um, Chosen Few with me and played in Free Flight, he said that um, I owe the guys in the band, they are the ones who trained me to work with delinquent teen boys. <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, and I, I ended up with, I have a daughter who is a doctor herself, a medical doctor, and hopefully she's, she's watching from Elk Grove with my son-in-law and my new um, grandson who is just a month old, uh, Jackson Koji Randall, Baba T says hi. So hopefully they're watching. Um, and uh, we moved to, after my daughter was born, we moved to um, Fresno, because that's where my sister was, and with her family. And I continued to work as a social worker, but then I worked for about 32 years with developmentally disabled adults, and retired, and was hoping to sing again, and ended up having nerve damage to part of my uh, vocal cords. So I have only one half of my vocal cord works and the other half doesn't, which luckily I was able to talk again, but probably not able to sing again. So my, my hope of going back to work with all these guys as I got, when I got older kind of crashed. So not able to do that, but I at least able to enjoy their company. David? So uh, Carry On actually played uh, for very many, uh, let's see, we played up until about uh, 2000, early 2000. And um, a lot of people don't know that because we stopped playing in the Asian circuit and started playing other things. But um, uh, the band, you know, still continues and we're trying to get back together to play some of these reunion dances that you guys like so know about, uh, Swanky and, uh, and yeah. So we would like to do that, but it, I was telling them that it's very hard because we're all older now, and everybody's, uh, you know, you can tell I can't even pick up my own microphone when I drop it. 
Uh, thank you, Gerald, for pointing that out to everybody. Uh, but uh, no. So, yeah, we really would like, in fact, I was talking to Tina that, you know, maybe she could come and play with us and sing background and maybe not lead, but she could do something like that. But, you know, we all enjoy playing music so much, and we're so lucky to have been able to have that chance to play because everyone that went to the dances, I think, that I talked to, they all say how special time that was in their lives. But really, for us, it was a very special time for us. It's something we remember really vividly, and we talk about it and how much fun we had and what a great uh, you know honor it was for us to be able to play for those uh, jobs and uh, so I'm just very thankful that we're still here if you look at the book there's a lot of guys in that book that in the in the section where they passed that that aren't here with us and so we're very thankful that we're still here we were talking about that earlier in the green room yeah, yeah you know I, I want to talk about something uh, <coughs> that it needs to be talked about. Uh, David Jingu, who I always considered, you know, the greatest uh, guitarist of our Sansei rock uh, era, um, you know, tragically in uh, December of 78, he was shot and killed at our place of business, the Baby Lion. And, uh, you know, for me, of course, that was a life-changing moment, you know. it's. Uh, I, I just, at that time, remember not wanting to ever play again. Excuse me. Uh, so we decided, you know, we were going to, or I, my wife and I decided we were going to sell the business. Uh, and I wasn't sure what I was going to go into. And uh, I know that some of our regular customers at the Baby Lion were these people from the IRS. You know, they would hang out at the bar, <laughs> and, uh, and, and they would uh, close shop. You know, they would, they would be there early during happy hour, and then when I shut the doors at 2 o'clock in the morning, they were still there. <laughs> and, and I thought, what kind of job do you have where you, you can drink all night and <coughs> still get up in the morning and go to work? It was amazing. So uh, they, they said, uh, hey, you know, why don't you come on down, take the uh, civil service exam? And I thought, you know, I don't want to do that. But they, they convinced me to uh, take something called the professional and administrative career exam. And uh, I guess I did well, because the next week they were calling me saying, you want a job with the IRS? And uh, it was like, you know, when I initially went to work for the IRS, I would go home to my, my, and tell my wife, I was saying, you won't believe this. CC7, he carries a gun. <laughs> it, was like, it was like, you know, I didn't know the actual names of the, a, a lot of these IRS employees that came into the bar, but I knew what they drank. So, <laughs> you know, we used to refer to them like Crown Rocks or CC7. Um, but when I initially started working for the IRS, I thought, you know, I'll stay at this job for a, a year, maybe, and then uh, go into some other business for myself. But, you know, it was kind of nice to have health insurance and, uh, <laughs> and weekends off, you know. Um, so, you know, that one year actually turned into 30 years, and I know... I know some of my IRS buds are here today. Thank you for supporting me over the years. And on top of that, when we go to social functions, I'd always tell Harry, don't tell people what you do. <laughs> it was a mood killer. But I, they want to take the business card back. But uh, I, I must say that uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but uh, my best friend here, he became the number one Asian American in the Treasury Department while he was there. I think he deserves a round of applause. Now, we're starting to get some uh, Q&A, some questions coming in from the audience, if it's OK. Would you guys all jump sure. into some of this? We have one here from Jeff Chop. It says, with the San Francisco music scene, they had more experimental sounds. Did any SoCal Asian American bands play original music? If not, why did nobody create new sounds or songs? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, 
<laughs> simply because we got paid for playing the hits. Oh. Yeah, I, uh, I remember that uh, there was a real distinct difference. What we wanted to be was what was called a cover band, where we would like try to learn the songs that were out that were popular and try to get it as close to being uh, how it sounds on the record. That was a really big thing for us to try to make it sound almost as close to what was on the record. And so that was a skill in itself to be able to do that. But bands like Hiroshima, they were very brave because, you know, they took a chance and they, and look where they are and look where I am, right? So they did. <laughs> they, they took the, but it was really hard because in those days, a lot of people don't know, but uh, Hiroshima used to open for us. And the reason was is that they played mostly original songs, so a lot of the, the people, they didn't really you know, want to hear that. They wanted to hear stuff they could dance to. So Hiroshima would open up, and by the time they were done, and then the next band came on, the next band, you know, not that many people were there. But uh, that's, uh, you know, I always, Dan Kuramoto is a good friend of mine, and I always kid him about that and tell him, you know, yeah, you guys used to open for us. You know? <laughs> How's the Hiroshima open for Carry On, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Hiroshima also played at Baby Lion every Thursday night, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we, we had a festival at Disneyland once, and uh, Stonebridge and Hiroshima sh shared the stage that came out of the uh, Tomorrowland stage that came out of the ground. And uh, people would come up, and we'd be playing Tower of Power and Tavares, and, and uh, they'd come up and play Asian rock. And, um, you know, the people from the Midwest eating their hamburgers sometimes didn't get it, but they're those who got the record deal. So I, I really tip my hat to Dan and June. Yep. Yeah. Yes. You know, uh, if, if Dan is listening in on uh, virtual here, you know, he, Dan is a very deep, oh, is he here? Where is he? Put your hand up. Hey, you know, when, when Dan first approached me about playing at the Baby Lion, man, Dan, he's a pretty demanding guy. He's, you know, he, he said, uh, I don't want you to, you know, you can't, you can't charge cover charge. And, you know, there's no drink minimum. I'm thinking, man, I'm the bar owner. And, you know, <laughs> and, and here he is. He's dictating terms, that, you know, for. Uh, Gary, you remember how much you paid him? So? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Hiroshima night was kind of fun because it was. You know, the people that came in on Thursday nights were dedicated to, you know, to they were really dedicated to sitting there and listening and grooving on the music. And, uh, you know, we enjoyed those nights. Those were some yeah. fun nights. Uh, I think there's a, there's, there's the truth be told is that you had the courage to express yourself and what was in your spirit as far as musicality. And uh, it's, it's just a lesson to all of us that if you copy success, that's one thing. But if you create it, manifest it, that's a whole different ballgame. So very good on you, Dan. H had I known you were here, Dan, I wouldn't have said all those nice things about you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, he's a buddy. I, you know, we're, we're like this. <laughs> Used to be. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give him a spam let me, of let me tell you fine. one last story about Dan Kuramoto. Oh. So, oh. so wait, wait, you know, I got a we million were, of them if you, you know, run out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when we were putting together the initial Sansei All Star bands, you know, yeah. I, we approached Dan and uh, got him to play with us, and we were all dressed up in tuxes, tuxedos, white jackets, white jackets, white you know, red ties and everything. And I look over at Dan. He's got Zori on. He's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like he had his tux on, but he had these Japanese flip flops. So, and no socks. Yeah. He, he marches to his own drum. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I've got it, pictures, Dan. Yeah. It's, it, it's funny because I sent out a call to everybody saying, if you're coming, let me know. If you're one of the <coughs> band guys, let me know so I can make an, a name tag for you. Well, son of a gun, Dan never, never notified me he was gonna be here today, so I didn't make, sorry, Dan, you don't, you don't have a name tag. <laughs> but everybody knows who you are. All right, we have a question here from Juju, asking, what is one memory or moment or story of the Sansei dance era that you will forever remember? Tina, do you have one? Forever remember? Forever Gosh. remember. I don't think I could narrow it down to just one. 
There were so, really so many yeah. things, so many people. Yeah. You know. No. The relationships. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, a lot of fun. That's Love. really all I remember was I did it as long as it was fun to me, and it was oh. always fun. I love that. Harry, David, Gerald. Oh, my goodness. It's, 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 it's hard huh, to think of just one. To narrow it down, yeah. One that you'll all remember. Do you remember any of them? I do. I remember one. Can you tell kind me? Of the, the, yeah. the night the lights went out is what I call it, and I refer to it in the book. But uh, you know, some of you remember during that time there was a rougher element that came to the dances, and occasionally they <coughs> occasionally fights would break out, and you'd hear uh, a shout of East Side or West Side, and then. Uh, you know, another shout of "F you!" and a chair would go flying across the uh, across the room at Parkview. And mm -hmm. the thing I remember most was one day, or one night, where the combatants actually came up on stage, and they were fighting on stage, and we had to kind of protect our equipment from them. Yeah. yeah. And it was shortly thereafter that uh, you know they stopped having dances at. Uh, Parkview and Roger Young and is Ernie Masamoto in the audience somewhere? No. Where? No, no, okay. Ernie was a member of this group called the Triangle Boys, you know. And and Ernie liked to fight. He didn't come to the dances to dance or pick up on girls. He came to fight. So and the Triangle Boys would always hang out at the back of Parkview Women's Club. And they would just pick up our equipment and then go into the venue, taking the, taking the stuff into the, the back uh, door of uh, Parkview Women's Club without us asking, you know. And I knew, I knew exactly what they were doing. They were doing that to avoid having to pay, pay for a bid. Yeah. So one day, Ernie, you know, he says, Harry, you need some protection. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, Protection from what? And what he, was, what he was telling me was, I needed to pay them, the Triangle Boys, protection money so they wouldn't beat the hell out of me. Yeah. But uh, I was thinking, oh man, oh man, you know. Yeah, you, you brought that era to an end. You know, you had all that fighting. I remember that. And it, it was too bad because that, was, that signaled kind of the end of the old school Parkview Roger Young era, because shortly thereafter, Roger, or, uh, Roger Young Auditorium also shut it down because of the fights over there, too. Mm. Speaking of which, you want to tell them the Mary Wells story, Kona, Hawaii? Uh, we, had, uh, we continued on, uh, posted dance series, and we had uh, Royce was with us, I think uh, Harry and I, and uh, we had Kona, Hawaii Supper Club. And we had hired uh, Mary Wells, and uh, we had two sold-out shows. And we did a sound check, and we put it together. Howie, well, you were there, right? And and uh, she didn't show up for sound check. And and we said, okay. So we call in. We couldn't reach her, and she didn't show up for the ten minutes to go to showtime. Sold-out room, corner Hawaii. Oh, no. Second show was waiting in the hallway. And she didn't show up. And uh, she, it went on, and pretty soon the crowd started yelling at us. All the waitresses started clocking out. And uh, her, she comes running in late. Maybe we had 15 minutes to go. I said, get on stage. And she says, well, um, what she say? She said, uh, we got lost, she and her husband. And uh, so I went in to quell the audience down. I said, you know what? Turn on all the lights. It's, it, well, if you turn all the lights in a room with a hostile crowd, it kind of throws a blanket on it. And I said, folks, we don't know what's happening. She's late, but I will refund you every dollar if she doesn't show up. So the audience just calmed down. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so we went on and did it. And then her, and, and by this time I was in the backstage and I, I you know, I was uh, nervous. And then we hit the second show. And by then a lot of people had left because they thought we were scamming them. And her husband comes running and he said, we had a flat tire. <laughs> so they had two different stories, remember that? 
And uh, that was one nail biter uh, that we had all, all the cats in the band with us. And uh, it, it, it was a scary scene. Brittany was in the back. It was Kona Hawaii in my back office. And we locked up the family, the kids in, in the offices. We called it security. I used to get these big Samoan guys and put them in small t-shirts because you know, they're cut. <laughs> And, 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 and put them on each Masa and Missy and put them on each side of the stage and they're standing there ready to beef with people and man it got tough and we had to put the kids and, and all the family Lisa her mom we put them all in my back office and we locked the door remember that and that was probably one of the more uh, nail biting moments for us all I don't remember that at all <laughs> yeah. I was just eating my cherry my, my Ikura Cheerio Sushi <laughs> Okay, we have a question here from Ian. Yonsei wannabe rocker here. Absolutely loved reading the book and listening to all of you talk. Do you see a potential revival of the Japanese-American dance band scene or other forms of music for Japanese-Americans by Japanese-Americans in the near future? That's a great question. You know, all of us here in this room, we were very fortunate to have grown up when we did, you know. Uh, just looking back on those days, I mean, they were great days. And uh, Ian, you know, I, I've, uh, I know I've talked to you before, and uh, I can't see it happening again. Um, you know, kids, I, I, I don't think just have the dedication to want to practice and get together with their friends and play in bands. Uh, that was all we wanted to do. I mean, you know, that was, that was our goal in life is to play in a band. And I don't see that happening with the younger kids. <coughs> and, you know, we were just so fortunate to have the opportunity to actually play live music and have people come and pay to see us play. That was incredible. You know, we were very fortunate. So, I mean, we were, we were, we were very thankful. And I, I just, I don't see that ever happening again. It was a special subculture that existed during that time, and uh, we, were, we were very fortunate to have grown up during that time. That being said, Ian, if you want to create something, I know a lot of Japanese-American yonsei who would want to uh, <laughs> maybe, st maybe start up a little band. Um, from Jimmy. Are you aware of, or do you know of, any current Nikkei or Asian-American artists currently on the scene? Tied, kind of tied together. I guess, I guess that's your answer. <laughs> we, all right, we have one here from Jeff Louie. From a Sansei American perspective, what do you think is the reason or are the reasons for the long-lasting popularity and reverence for Sansei dance era genre of music and dance scene culture? Well, you know, I, I, I think I can, from my perspective, uh, it, it, this is just the... the uh, Sansei dancing just didn't happen in Los Angeles. It happened in San Francisco and Northern California and also in Hawaii. Honolulu. Which, yeah, which I didn't know about that until fairly recently that there's these groups called uh, Greenwood, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. and, and I look at them and I think, right. wow, they're just like what we were, you know, only it was in Hawaii. So it's interesting that at that time, I think all the, the Asians and also the Mexican-American communities, we kind of had our own identity crisis being in America and being minorities. And it gave us some place to go where we could see people that from other areas of the city all there basically to have a good time and listen to the music, but to dance and to meet people. And it was a social scene for, for many of the Sanseis uh, uh, in those days. And that's what made it really special, I think. Uh, but it occurred everywhere in the country, not just, uh, not just here. I think it was a generational form of expression uh, as the baby boomers came out of, um, you know, the, uh, most of our parents, if you're Sansei, our parents were in internment camps and they had big band music. And when we came out, you know, the community was a little bit different than when they went in. And for the Sanseis to grow up right at that embryonic time when they're starting into adulthood, they had this music that they can exp express themselves with. And backstage, we're talking with uh, David, Tina, and, and Harry. Is that uh, we feel that the music of the 60s and 70s was the pop 
a golden pop era where songs are written with emotion and we wanted to be like those guys and express ourselves like the, the Young Rascals, the Righteous Brothers, Buffalo Springfield, uh, Temptations. And it was and it was pre-social media. No one had a computer. No one had a cell phone. And so today, uh, in, in, when I had a music star, I realized that uh, this generation, generations, you can take, back then when I music store, you can take a $10 roll of quarters, go to arcade and play a video game and at $10 worth, you're kind of proficient. But you get a $10 guitar lesson, you can't even tune the guitar. So that immediate satisfaction, I think, has changed it. So what Harry said, he doesn't see the bands coming back, is that who's willing to put in the time, energy, and effort to really, really hone their craft? Uh, you know, Harry and I, you know, many times we talk about how, how we had to woodshed. And we talk about you, Dan, how you came up and played sax and learned how to play keyboards. And uh, it takes time. Oh. And right now, the diversion of electronic media, <clears throat> you know, a kid could sit in his room and, and create music off a computer. The magic we had was that we got all these people, human beings, sitting in somebody's garage and were able to interact and uh, enjoy each other's company. It's a big difference, uh, that emotional connection. Yeah, that's a good point. That is true, yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, real quick, I want to touch on one more thing as, uh, as we close this out. I'm just curious, I'm posing this to, to each and every one of you. As this new chapter of life unfolds, I'm curious what is motivating you and what's next. Uh. Tina? Um. What's motivating me is my little one-month-old grandson. So that's all I can think of right now is I'm anxious to get back there and take care of him. Yeah, that's yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. David? Uh, well, you know, we're still trying to get our whole band together to play. We've been talking about it. Yeah. We, we've been, we have, we, you know, we really want we really want to, but it's very hard. It's really really hard. So, uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do something. Just because we we know we're in the twilight of our musical time or our time here, you know. So we don't take that for granted. We know that uh, time is short and it's very precious, and that uh, a lot of guys that we used to play with can't any longer. So we feel like maybe we should do something. But we're trying, trying to keep it going. Yep. Uh, Harry and I talk about all the time is uh, he says, Gerald, I said, you know, we've been blessed, everyone in this room, we've been blessed with extra innings in life. Harry calls it, we got a lot of tread on our tires. And the other day, we were talking about this Sansi Rocker Chronicles. And, and he says, you know, brah, it's sure nice to come into our fourth quarter and have this going on. I says, fourth quarter? We're at halftime. <laughs> We're still in the locker room. We're coming out on the third corner hot and heavy. And, and he laughed. He says, you know, brah, you're right. So our spirit says, uh, especially our generation, we have been blessed with extra time. And if you looked at it, when Harry started the book, he'd share it with me as he was coming along. He had four people in the memoriam list. Then it became 30-something. And if you look around you, oh, we have the ability now, now because of uh, just expediency to create what we want. This is the best time. I call it the Super Bowl of humanity. And I think uh, whoever's here today, uh, we can create whatever we want because we have the resources. You know, I feel like I'm a young man in an old man's body. <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Much like Dave, you know, this is crazy, but I want to play again. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I want to get behind the B3. You know, I don't want to play a Farfisa again. <laughs> so uh, one of the things kind of, you know, as a, the next steps to the book is uh, Sansei Rocker behind the curtain. It's, it's like a, uh, it's a stage production that we're putting together that is kind of a documentary, but also set to music. So the documentary portion will be a film portion, 
and then the actual music will be live, okay? And, uh, you know, initially I thought, you know, heck, I, I wrote this book and I kind of financed uh, the book out of pocket. I'll finance this, uh, you know, this uh, Sansei rocker behind the curtain out of pocket. And then I thought, shit, this is going to be costly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started thinking, you know, it might be nice to get some a grant or some funding, you know, because you know, I want to use professionals on the job job, you know, and uh, I want to use some people that deserve to get paid. So uh, that, that's what I'm working on right now. And I'd like to, God willing, bring it to a place like the Tateuchi here, because I want a smaller venue for it. You know, I want people to be able to see us and actually hear the music and see us playing it. And uh, the only way to have that happen is to have it in a in a more intimate setting like this. So, uh, you know, I, I talked to, uh, where's Joy? I talked to Joy a little bit earlier in the week and, uh, you know, I have some uh, proposals or maybe some ideas that um, we might hold some other events in here and the next time you're in here, there'll be live music. Yes. So uh, that's, yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned, because uh, I, I even went out and bought a synthesizer. Son of a gun, I said I, I was never going to do that. You know, a, a, uh, I, I got a synthesizer, but, you know, I can't play it yet. And what I always tell Gerald is, nothing happens without an impending event. Yeah. Okay? Once we get that impending event down there, and then I scramble like hell to get it together. You, you know, like this symposium, it was kind of like a figment of my imagination a year ago. I thought, oh yeah, symposium, we'll do one. But we weren't doing anything to, to bring it together until there, we had the date. You know, once we had the date, then we scrambled like hell to get this thing together. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. yeah. No, I believe, um, Harry, you had some thank yous that you wanted to uh, extend. I do. You know, this thing didn't happen by itself. I mean, it took a lot of work to put this thing together. You know, first of all, I'd like to, to thank all of you for being here to uh, support us, to support me thank in uh, these efforts. <laughs> you know, with my memory, I need something written. So first of all, I'd like to talk. I'd like to thank the the panel, uh, Brittany, for agreeing to uh, be our moderator. Uh, yeah. uh, we have uh, Gerald, David, and Tina. Uh, I, I call it I call it the dream team. You know, when uh, when I started putting this together, I, w I wanted representative people that uh, you know I think would have been interesting, and I couldn't have picked a better panel, so. And I couldn't have picked a better moderator, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of other people that helped me here. Um, you know, uh, I was fortunate to meet up with uh, Scott Nagatani. Poor Scott. Is he up in the sound booth? Yeah, Scott, Scott, yeah. I mean, Scott's a genius. Did you see the video that uh, was playing as you walked in? You know, I want all of you tonight to go back, uh, go on your YouTube channel, or go on YouTube and listen to that video again. That was genius, the way he came up with that. And he came up with the original Sansei Rocker Symposium video, the, the eight minute one. That was his work, you know. And it, and I'm hoping to, to continue working with Scott here. So uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, Kenny Ito, where's Kenny? Yeah, you know, Kenny's been in my life a long time. He's been part of the, he's been a friend of the Manaka family since, oh gosh, we were youngsters, yeah, toddlers. Um, but uh, Kenny helped with the sound, you know, he's expert at sound and, uh, 
You know, there's a, there's a, uh, a Japanese world, word called hazukashi. You know what that means? You're, you, you know, Japanese, we're kind of shy or we don't want to, uh, to uh, put ourselves out there. So, uh, you know, we came here on Tuesday to do the sound check and, you know, to check the video out. And um, so I went out to eat with uh, Corey Shiozaki. Where's Corey? Right there. Corey and uh, <laughs> Kenny and my, wa and my wife. And uh, we're sitting around and I'm telling them, man, I sure hope that video works on Saturday. <laughs> and they said, well, let's go back and check it out again. I said, Oh man, I don't want to call them up. And they said, "No, you know, you only have one chance to do it right. You know, you can't be embarrassed about these things." And I said, "Man, I can't call Joy up and tell tell her we're coming back to check it out again." And they said, "We're gonna go." And so Corey and Kenny, they came back here to to make sure the video and the sound was okay. Thank you, both of you. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> We got a fabulous camera team too, by the way. Here, uh, led it up, led up by Corey Shiozaki of Manzanar Fishing Club fame, and con you know, let's congratulate Corey on uh, that particular work. Uh, but uh, Corey's going to be with me on this uh, project to, uh, you know, to do this uh, Sansei rocker behind the curtains. So uh, we look forward to that. But also on the uh, camera team was George Wada. Where's George? George. Yeah. Uh, Steve Nagano. I see Steve up there. And uh, Lorraine Miata was part of our camera team, too. She was uh, getting our waivers for us for uh, the uh, man on the street, or man and woman on the street videos that we were filming, which we were also going to do after. Right, Corey? OK. So you know, those of you who haven't had a chance to uh, get in front of the camera, I would encourage you to do so because we would love to have your uh, thoughts, okay? Uh, let me see who else. Brett Hirata. Brett in the audience here? Hey, Brett, okay. Brett is with uh, OC Imprints and uh, he, he um, did the t-shirts up and he helped me with these badges, these beautiful badges, so uh, thank you, Brett. And he also made a few hats for uh, our kids and my family, so thank you, Brett. Uh, Mary Gao, is she in here? Come on, don't hide. Yeah, yeah. Mary was responsible for uh, my the flyer design. You know, when when I uh, was uh, trying to decide what I would put on the Facebook to uh, you know to post just uh, to advertise the symposium, Mary helped me with that. She also came up with the logo design, the Sansei Rocker logo design and these uh, badge designs. I had them way too busy at initially, and Mary uh, toned them down, so thank you. Um, <laughs> my uh, book writing wife, Candace Oda, is she, is she here? Candace, yeah. Candace Oda was, helped me tremendously, in fact, uh, during the, the summer I wrote my book in the summer of 2020, uh, I probably talked to Candace more than I spoke to my wife. You know? So, and, and Candace is a night owl. So she'd wake me up like in the middle of the night with an idea. But, uh, you know, after the book was written, I kind of kind of missed talking to Candace, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much, Candace, you know, for the uh, editing and uh, the creative input you had in the book. Appreciate that. The ladies of Theta Kappa Phi, are you here? All right. I can't thank you enough for the support that you've shown me. I mean, from day one, you were there for me. Thank you so much. And you know, <laughs> yeah. and we're missing one of them. I'm sorry. She's here in spirit. Yeah, we're in here. That's why we're all here together. Beverly Miyamoto Munch. Yeah. She passed away 
last week, and it really breaks my heart that she's not here, but she's, she's here with us in spirit. Thank you, though, for supporting me. And, you know, these ladies have me uh, periodically on their Zoom calls, and I, I keep asking them, geez, don't you get tired of me? You know, it's like, a, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Debbie and Terry Liu, are you here? Yeah. Both Debbie and Terry, they're not only our travel partners, Debbie's my wife, Chris's cousin, but uh, they did a lot of running around just uh, logistically to get things together for this, so thank you, Debbie and Terry. Thanks, that's it. Um, I'd also like to shout out to everyone who's joined us on Zoom and in the overflow space. We have uh, the messenger Imperial Valley in the house, uh, Diane and Glenn Kodama. Dynasty and Crosswinds, Ken Ong. Um, it's been a joy. I'm sure we can keep talking and sharing a lot more stories. And we can continue to do that in, I believe, the courtyard space or out here. We're out here in the lobby. Uh, if you all want to make your way out there, I'm going to invite Joy back up here uh, to close this out. But thank you so much for joining us this <laughs> afternoon. Thank you. Um, can I get one more round of applause for all of our panelists today? Um, so uh, we do have books on sale in the lobby as well as t-shirts. We um, are just asking that folks do not rush, us, <laughs> rush too much um, just so that we can make sure that we keep a line. And then we'll also have a book signing in, a lo in the lobby. Um, so we'll have two separate lines for those. Um, and we would love for you to, of course, yes, yeah, stay, mingle. I know this is very much a reunion. Um, so we're really excited to have you here. Um, please visit the museum. Um, and yeah, enjoy Little Tokyo today. Um, and one more round of applause for Tina Fujino, Gerald Ishibashi, David Honjil, Harry Manaka, and of course, Brittany Ishibashi. So with that, thank you so much. Um, stay safe, have a really great afternoon, um, and we look forward to seeing you back here again.